Well, this is really, really sweet. We don't oftentimes get to do Christmas evening, Christmas Eve as a family, and then come back and do Christmas morning the next day together here as a church family. And so that is a, a huge blessing I have been pondering and very excited about. If you want, you can go in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to be there just briefly talking through that. What is so important about someone's name? William Shakespeare's Romeo would state, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. Yet we as parents uh, give a different demonstration all too often. If you're like us, when we started having our kids, we found we were pregnant, and instantly we get the baby books out, and we start reading all these names and their meanings and the different soundings you could have. And so you, you figure that out, and you get one that you like, and then you got to pair it with the other names and make sure they all work okay together and that it doesn't sound funny. Or heaven help that you, you get the three names together, and you've got some weird thing going on with, with the initials. And so you got to be really careful. You think this all out, and then you give it a couple years. And that child is standing there exasperating you and will not stop, and you're willing to go with any name that comes out. You start with their siblings, and you go through that Rolodex. Then you go to your siblings, and you get through them. Then you get to pets, maybe neighborhood children, a few other names. You don't care what to call the child as long as the child stops and looks at you And listens. With that idea of names in mind, tonight we're going to look at a few names and hopefully with them trace a whole story that God has met our greatest need through sending Jesus as a baby over 2,000 years ago. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew introduces Jesus and the whole of the New Testament by focusing on four names or titles for him. And so we'll briefly look at each of those four, too. Though those titles trace us back from the beginning of time all the way to the birth of Jesus. And so we want to walk through this genealogy a little bit as well. In verse 1, Matthew introduces this. He says, The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Those, those four titles, those four names. But he starts by calling it the record of the genealogy that, that word for genealogy is actually the word from which we get Genesis, the first book of the Bible, where it all began. The start not just to Jesus's, but all of our genealogy from Adam and Eve. And sadly, the start to sin as well. The book begins with man in perfect relationship with God, and yet by Genesis chapter 3, man has sinned and relationship with God is broken. In doing so, Adam dooms not only himself, but but his progeny, all of us, to the same fate of separation from God. Sin became a part of our heritage and genealogy, inherited from Adam and pursued by us. In everything we think, everything we say, everything we do that breaks God's law and displeases him. And that would be a very sad state had the book ended there. But in the midst of the mess that man created, God also gave a promise of a way back to relationship with himself. He said, someone from Eve's seed, one of her descendants, would deal with the sin for all of us, restore us back to God. But it would be at a very high cost to himself. So Genesis progresses in a series from one generation to the next to the next, to the next, seeking to find that descendant that would meet our greatest need. Building on that first book of Genesis then, Matthew now writes a new Genesis, a second beginning. He again focuses on a genealogy, but of another man, different from Adam. He focuses us down to that descendant of Eve that God has promised would come to answer our biggest need. And so we begin with the first of the four titles of Jesus. Here he focuses on. He calls him the son of Abraham. Verse 2, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Matthew starts here with Abraham because Abraham is the very next person after Eve to get a promise from God of a special descendant. God tells him that all the people of the earth will be blessed through him. 
this begins the nation of Israel. This promise gives the hope of an ultimate reversal of the fall and blessing for all people through this, this one descendant. So the promised descendant of Eve will be the promised descendant of Abraham and will bring all people blessing. But how, with sin still present, man is still lacking his greatest need, reconciliation to God. And so with that question, Matthew moves on in the genealogy through many other names till he comes to the second name for Jesus, son of David. Look at verses 5 and 6. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David, the king. David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. We, we start getting into these names that we recognize again. Ruth and Boaz from the book of, book of Ruth. Or Jesse, David's father from 1 Samuel. In verse 6, we see that he steps out just briefly from the genealogy to emphasize something. He emphasizes David's kingship. David, the king over Israel. David, too, just like Abraham and Eve, was given a promise by God for a special descendant. God told him that he would have an heir that would eternally reign on his throne. He would have a king of his line that would be over Israel. And while that didn't make complete human sense, David chose to trust God. So, so now we have the promised descendant of Eve and Abraham that is now also a promised descendant of David. Not only will he bring blessing to all people, but he will rule and reign perfectly forever. But again, how? Sin still present, man is still far from God. From David, the genealogy, and with it, the history of Israel and its kings progresses. Worse and worse kings of David's line emerge until eventually all of Israel is overtaken and kicked out of the land to Babylon. Verse 11 talks about this. Josiah became the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. In spite of their failure and this punishment, the line, and with it, God's promise, had not ended. The genealogy continues, giving people time to hope and long for a final promised one to come. They were hoping for a Messiah. Which brings us to the third name that Matthew gives for Jesus. Look at verses 16 and 17. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. We sang about this really. The prophet Isaiah, years after David, wrote a prophetic promise from God about one who would rule perfectly while bringing God to men and men to God. This was the one who was hoped for, the Messiah, the anointed one. Just as David was anointed king, so this Messiah would be the final one of his lineage, to be the ultimate and eternal anointed one, the king God had promised. But not just a king. Vincent states, anointing was applied to kings, to prophets, and to priests. Hence, the word Christ or Messiah was representative of our Lord who united in himself the offices of prophet, priest, and king. So the promised descendant of Eve, Abraham, and David not only will be a blessing for all people, reign perfectly forever, but will also prophetically represent God to people and priestly represent people to God. This sounds wonderful. But again, how can this Messiah accomplish this with sin still present and thus man still separated from God? This brings us to the last of the four titles. Look at verses 18 through 20, the, the Christmas story that we know so well. 
Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Rather than a royal and exalted birth, this great descendant that would seem to deserve, Jesus was born in a barn to a young girl, seemingly out of wedlock, into a normal life, and cradled in an animal's feed trough. His birth, while rather unremarkable, Yet his purpose is summarized in his final title and name, which are astounding. His name means Yahweh saves. Look at verse 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Those of you our younger kids here, you sang a song a few Sunday mornings ago. Hopefully you remember that. She will bear a son. You will call his name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. This is where that truth comes from. Matthew is explaining that Jesus, the Messiah, did not just come to deal with such small things as political issues or rivalries going on. He came to save us from the very sins that separate us from the only one who can fully satisfy, God himself. He is the answer to our greatest need of the hereditary problem we each have of our sin from Adam. He is the fulfillment of not just God's promise of a Messiah through Isaiah, God's promise of a kingly line to David, God's promise of a blessing for all people to Abraham, but all the way back to Genesis, to his promise to Eve of a descendant that would finally deal with our sin problem and restore us to God. But how is Jesus able to do this? Verses 22 and 23 tell us, Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Jesus is not just a man with a human genealogy. He is God himself. As such, he alone could bear the price of our sin for us and offer us the righteousness of God that we needed to restore us to him. Only Jesus, as God and man, could accomplish and fulfill God's promise to Eve. And so, verse 24, Joseph awoke with his, from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife. And kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. God's promise of restoration was fully fulfilled in the one we call Jesus. But the story doesn't have to end that night in Bethlehem 2,000 plus years ago. At least not for you. God offers that second Genesis, a new birth for you as well. The babe in the manger came to meet our greatest need, but he did so not in an unknown manger, but hung publicly, executed on a cross for all to see. It is God. He did not stay dead, but he rose again, and he lives to offer each of us life in his name. He is Jesus. He will save all who come. He will deal with our sins, making a way for us to come back to God and restoring what was broken for us all the way back to the garden. Will you come to him tonight? All you have to do is admit that your sin separates you from God and then ask that Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross be applied as a payment for that sin to cover you. If he will do so, you will be saved. He will save his people from their sins.
gospel. It's night. We looked through these four names briefly and see that Jesus is the answer to our biggest need. But, but there is so much more that we can learn and enjoy about Christmas. And I would encourage you to come back tomorrow morning. We'd love to see you. We'd love to, to have you join us to see more about not just what Matthew calls Jesus, but what Jesus calls himself. We'll talk more about the babe in the manger and how he's not only the answer to our biggest need, but the answer to our biggest questions we can have in this life as well. And so we hope to see you back here with the church family tomorrow, Christmas morning. Let me pray for us. Father, we are thankful that you are a faithful God, a God who makes promises and fulfills those promises from the very beginning of time all the way to Jesus' coming to this very day, this very Christmas Eve night. Lord, thank you that Jesus is the answer to your promises and offers the hope of salvation from our greatest problem, our sin. Lord, we ask that you would draw us to yourself for anyone who does not know you, even here tonight, that this Christmas Eve might not just celebrate the birth of your son, but the new birth of a soul. So we thank you again for him. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.